Richard. Hello, thank friend. You for, thank you for doing this with me. Ah, you know, I'm going to have so much fun. We're all going to have a ton of fun. It's these it one, some of my favorite subjects. And I love the wings you picked. You know, it's just a great, yes, the, the Air Force Museum I, is enormous. The, the museum is enormous and we're going to go and take a look at it. So we're now effectively spread across um, kind of the, the part of the world that we have here. So I'm in Germany over here. You are, what's funny is <laughs> um, that Vancouver is under clouds, but that's yes, it's, probably... it's pouring rain here, but you know, it's springtime. That's what we had a nice week of sunshine and it's just bucketing outside. So there's our, no resentment our... from elsewhere in the house that I'm just happily sitting in my office for the day. It's not a dime to be going outside. Yeah, our weather is, uh, um, I don't know, it's, I, I assume that Google's uh, cloud covers are actually accurate, are they? Yeah, I don't know, it seems appropriate. We, it is cloudy here. Huh, so it's so cloudy, it's a little cloudy here. Okay, mm -hmm. so where we're going altogether is um, to the National Museum of the United States Air Force, which is... Ohio here in Dayton, Ohio. So if we, if we go and go a little bit further away from that, there's the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is probably, it is the center of the heart of the Air Force. That's where most of the developments were initiated more or less and that's where everything is uh, coming from and going to and of course there's lots of air force bases where other testing happens but i, I think i think wright patterson is the heart of the air force and so therefore they also have a museum on the old airfield so this is effectively the new base and that is um, the old base uh, with as you can see, kind of this triangle, shorter runways. Very World War and, II, that triangle runway setup. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so there's a bunch of, uh, uh, this is, this is, so, you know, this is the, uh, the, um, the research facilities, lots of research facilities of the Air Force. And then, um, you know, the town of Dayton, where I've been twice, is over here. There's a hotel and a bar and a hotel and a bar and well, they have actually a pretty nice kind of area where you can go and drink um, and, and have food. Um, and so this is the museum. The museum is, is enormous. It has, f has these four giant hangars. How do you turn this around? Uh, like this, wait, please, yes. So it has these four giant hangers. This hangar was not um, finished apparently when they um, did this uh, picture. That picture must be over five years old. I'm disappointed, Google. Um, and <laughs> Taking aerial so, photographs of the Air Force is always a challenge. Well, that's, that's probably true. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we can't do all of these, all of these hangers because they are, as I said, ginormous. And if you just go and take a look at, at kind of for reference, the cars, how big they are versus those hangers, I mean, mm -hmm. they are enormous. Um, so what we'll do is um, we're just gonna pick two parts of this. There is the research and development gallery. We're gonna go and take a look at that. And then here is um, the Cold War gallery and we'll see how far we get. Now, we're not gonna do this on Google Maps, on, on Google Earth, obviously, but we're gonna do this here. So there's a website called NM USAF Virtual Tour, and that is a very fantastic um, tour of um, this museum. So we're going to go and um, and utilize that site. And now we're going to move you, all, move you all out of the way, and uh, we're going to start in the research gallery. So here's where we are. So you can zoom around. Shuttle knows. Yeah, yeah, it's a shuttle nose. We're going to ignore the shuttle completely. Okay. Yeah, I'd just get angry if we did. Yeah, well, we can do this next time. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, so, but, but just for note, this is the crew compartment trainer. And so this is not a real, it looks like a shuttle, but it's not a real shuttle. Yeah. But that's how the, the astronaut, that's the vehicle, well, the mock-up with which the astronauts um, trains um, how to, uh, um, um, you know, deal with the, with the shuttle. And there's a, 
similar looking one that is in Seattle at the Museum of Flight, which is the fuel, full fuselage trainer. Um, but anyways, I digress. So you can go and walk through and we're gonna talk about some of those. And, but we're gonna start with, so amazing airplanes, we'll talk about some of those. But before we talk about airplanes, we're gonna talk about something completely different. We're gonna talk about this. Let's see whether you can see this better from here, but probably you can. So we're gonna go pick this one, just pick this angle. All right. This thing is um, about the size of a school bus, and it is a satellite. And it's quite the amazing satellite. It is the keyhole satellite, or keyhole hexagon satellite, and it's a CIA project. Yep. Richard, yep. What, what do you know about it? Well, it's, uh, it is the most advanced version of a film-based uh, spy satellite. So this is 1970s technology. So the, it's mm -hmm. funny the things you need to think of before CCDs were really a thing, and CCDs largely driven by the spy industry. And uh, before GPS, so just the navigational systems built into it to be able to know where it is, and to be able to take accurate photographs before there were uh, satellites surrounding the planet so that it could relay data in real time. Most stuff that they did with this thing had to be predicted and calculated by hand. Yeah. But you're I, talking about one of the most phenomenal uh, optical stereoscopic photographic systems, you know, flying out of Titan rockets back in the day, but yeah. they had to get the film back to land. That's right. So, so this is a spy satellite. And so generally the spy satellites job is to look down on earth and uh, shoot pictures. Uh, the pictures that these satellites are shot um, are still, the quality of those pictures is still classified. There are, you can, you can, so if you go on the, on the webpage here for, um, uh, KH9 Hexagon in Wikipedia, you can see an example of a photo. So this is a, um, a Russian airfield. And this is a bad resolution. And so there's a great talk by Phil Pressel, um, who's a, an old gentleman who is um, uh, uh, talking at the uh, museum about uh, the cameras. So effectively the view that you have here. And so it's a it's a it's in a one hour talk. It's it's absolutely amazing, and um, he was not that was one of the only things he wasn't allowed to talk about, or or one of the few things he wasn't allowed to talk about is how good those pictures are. Yeah. But he's kind of making some hints, and well, he, so he, he, he said the published resolution was ten feet. So yes, the individual pixels down to ten feet, and then he just sort of says he goes, "It's not true." Yes. <laughs> but I'm not yeah, allowed to tell you. <laughs> yeah, he talks about he talks about um, an image of Shea Stadium, which is a um, uh, it's a baseball stadium. Baseball stadium, New York. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So baseball stadium in New York, and he talks about um, um, being able to tell how many people there are um, in the stadium. Um, so uh, the resolution was apparently very good. Yeah, you so, can do that. That's probably three foot resolution. Yes. Uh, roughly, or one meter resolution. And these days we talk about that there's probably spy systems up there that are doing half meter resolution. Yeah, which is, which is amazing because the, those, those things here flew at a height of 90 to 200 miles. Miles, yeah. Miles um, around the earth. So they didn't have an you know, perfectly circular orbit, but they had a, um, a elliptic orbit, mm -hmm. and, and they went polar and on the polar orbit because the job that they had to do is they 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 were they were tasked with um, basically you know photographing any any every every place on Earth, and the way you do this is uh, using a polar orbit. Now, but you're consuming film, so they were probably pretty judicious about what they photographed. Because there's only so much film in those things. Admittedly, yes. there's 1,500 pounds of film in there. But, yes. you know, you right. are using up a strategic asset when you take these pictures. So, 
So now, now, we get to, now we get to the really weird part because is how long do those things live? <laughs> and it is when that film is done, <laughs> that whole satellite is done. Yeah, it really so, is. So they have, so at the back of this thing here, um, that's where the spools of film sit. They have two spools of film, each hold, um, so the film is six inches wide. Mm -hmm. Um, which is fairly substantial. And um, they have um, those rolls of film that I have in the, in the back are um, hold 30 miles of film, which is super, super, super thin. So they can actually go and roll this up. And they have two spools and those spools now, uh, of course, run against each other. Mm -hmm. So they're counter rotating so that they can go and keep this thing. Um, uh, Think about the problem of vibration, right? You're taking photographs of something you know where you want that three foot resolution a hundred miles away, the motors have to be perfectly smooth. This can't vibrate at all, or you're going to yes. screw up the picture. Yeah, and 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 they also run these. They they also run the the. They need to run the film smoothly by the camera, and then they need to go and and roll this up. Now let's go and take a look at another picture here. Yeah, into the uh, barrels. Yeah. Yes, and, and it's exactly where that film goes. So, so here are these here are these cameras, and and all the all the pictures that we're taking were in stereo. So they need to have two spools of films that ran through two cameras, which were sitting at a twenty degree angle because they wanted to have stereo, which means three D pictures. And they then have to be times so that the even though the length of runs are different because the cameras are one in front of each other for spacing, they have to time mm -hmm. them so that the two points align with each other exactly so that the stereo works. Yeah. So my, I just lost my picture. It's oh. going to return, hopefully. It'll, it'll come back. You're, everything's working on this side, buddy. You're still animated. You know, like your, your video is working for us. Yeah, yeah, my video is working, but my monitor is currently having oh, a, monitor, a, My monitor is having an episode. I'll give it a second. Yeah. So those four film cans, they call he called them the barrels, fill up with film one at a time from the one furthest out at the end to the one closest in. And once it's full, you can, a, a little guillotine cuts it off and then they start filling the next can. And then they, they are actually sent to re-enter the atmosphere. Correct. And then they have to be retrieved. So while they are parachuting back to land, a C-130... Hercules would snatch the uh, parachute out of the air and pull the canister into the aircraft and return it, which, which apparently worked every time except no, it didn't. One. Except it, for one. Twice. Yeah, there was one where the parachute so, didn't work properly. So because because that is so damn unbelievable. Let's see whether we can do pictures over whether we can do videos video over, over video. Okay. Yeah, let's let's try to do a video. I have not video. seen this video, but I I guess I love it. It's already go right. for it. So so this is the, this is the video they call the last bucket bucket catch, which is the in a um, uh, an interview with the two pilots who caught the last of all of those. And you knew how to fly it because we were all stacked in different altitudes, and we saw it maybe around. You know, 40, 45,000 feet, it was pretty high up there when you see the sheet, but you could not make a, a pass until 15,000 feet. You know, you're looking at an object that's going about 200 feet a second coming at you. When you're actually making the approach, you've only got a few seconds. I mean, I felt so much pressure um, as, we're, you know, we're the crew, you know, don't mess up, this is your chance. <laughs> On the, on the first pass. There, there, there was so much of course it did. Yeah, it, it was very... That is just... Did that work? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah, <laughs> just show the snatch. But again, it's like without GPS, you know, they it's pure calculation that they figured out roughly where that cap that bucket's going to be re-entering. And then they put airplanes up. They're using radar. They're just trying to find it and snatch it out of the air in that little bit of time that they have. Yeah. So this is, um, it's marvelous. So they built, um, I forget the number, like 20 of them? 20 of these, 19 of yeah. which flew. The last one was lost in a, uh, in a launch failure. And, and so, so um, 
the this the the satellite is also um, significant because it is basically a precursor of Hubble. So the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah, this is um, KH nine. The precursor to Hubble is KH eleven. Yeah, but but some of the tech that's yeah, without also a doubt. still being used in in, yeah. in Hubble is in here. So star tracking uh, system. The, the exactly. The, yeah, a lot of that stuff's going to be in there. But if you really want to freak yourself out, go look at a model of a KH eleven. It looks like Hubble because Hubble literally was a spare KH eleven. Different yeah, optics, and, but but the hull was already made, and that's why the uh, the uh, uh, NRO basically gave it to NASA because they they'd come up with a better design and they were ready to move on. So so let's 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 think about that for a second. Um, you have a you have a satellite that is a space telescope which is looking at far far away galaxies that have not yet been seen before at all. Yeah. Um, with astonishing quality and resolution. And they do this because they point this at space. And now imagine you use that exact same technology to go and look at Earth. Well, not exactly the same. The optical same. focal lengths are different, right? Like yeah, of course. Of different course. hardware. They, they, they can't use Hubble to look at the moon, for example. But it's, it's yes, yeah, because it's a camera. It's a, I mean, it's not a, it's, it's a, you know, it's like a telephoto lens, yeah. like my, my telephoto lens that I have. Uh, yeah, work you can't use it for macro work. Right, no, which is it, what it started at 150, and so it's useful. It's useless for yeah. a bunch of uh, scenarios. But that there. ability to point, you know, you think about something that's orbiting, so it's whizzing over the Earth, and you want to take detailed photos of one location. So as the satellite is flying over, you're continuously turning it to keep it pointed at the same spot. And this is the same thing. Think about what Hubble did when it did the deep field photos, the ones where it showed those galaxies that are insanely far away by pointing at literally a dark spot of the sky, orbiting at, at 400 miles up, it would repeatedly, you know, in half of its flight turn, turn to that same point in the sky and then hold that point as it orbited by. And then as it went in behind the Earth again, it would point to something else. You know, they have a series of pointing jobs, but all the Hubble does all day long is point in different locations at different points of its orbit and hold that angle using gyroscopes. Yeah. All That's that right. gyroscopic technology is in here. That's right. So it is. It is an astonishing piece of technology, and because it's because it's right here, because it's it's right in front of the XP seventy. Um, I thought that requires explanation um, because it's uh, it's in the research gallery, and so it's um, also hard to even know. When you look at it, it doesn't but, look like anything, right? It's just this weird thing. You're like, what is yeah, that? Yeah, and and you just walk by. What would have happened if? Go, Joe. I'm just curious if if they had pointed it at the if they pointed this at the stars back in the '60s, what, what could they have seen? You, you know, I realize the optics are different, but yeah. it must have been better than anything we had on the ground at the time. I yeah, I, I don't know that it would have been actually because the the mirrors are relatively small. Again, you're talking focal distances. It was designed to focus on things that were 100 to 200 miles away. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you try and aim at the star, oh, okay. you're not going to be able to see it. It wouldn't even get a good picture of the moon. Hey, because Hubble has sure. this. Hubble has a has the 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 mirror is kind of the the size of the the, the spacecraft. Yeah. Right. And this and here the mirror is just it's just uh, at the bottom of it. Well, and and there's two, right? They and there's two stereoscopic the imaging. Yeah. But but I think the idea so so the idea of Hubble now seems obvious, but yeah. it wasn't. Well, they did get it. You know, they did go down that path. And so that's a whole other story. Yeah, that, that is a whole other story. Do you um, to move on, friend? Yes, I think we're going to move on. Um, we're going to move on to, do, do you want to go and talk about the X-15 first? Sure. Yeah, for an airplane that only flew for a few years, everybody loves it, right? Yes. And this particular version of it, this is A2. This is a very, this was the, this is the fastest manned vehicle, winged vehicle ever flown. This well, atmospheric, in, in the atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, uh, so we're going to see lots of fast planes. Um, but this one is the fastest. And uh, it's a, it's a rocket powered, um, um, aircraft. And this rocket-powered aircraft is um, 
uh, could land. So, I mean, you see that it has wheels, um, but uh, it didn't take off by itself. It was carried by a mothership um, that was a B-52 bomber. So they put it under the wing of the B-52 bomber. And then, um, um, and then it was kind of dropped from there and um, then accelerated out and uh, reached up to Mach 7? 6.7 was that, that one flight in 1967. Yes. Which there's a whole set of stories around that. So this, this is an A ver variant. It was crashed. Uh, and after the crash, they, um, they modified it, stretched it, and added those bladder tanks, the, the red and white things. To, mm -hmm. to higher velocity uh, flights on it. it. Lots of folks are keen on, uh, if they saw the Armstrong movie where he has the incident in the X-15, this is not that X-15, it was the third one that he flew that, that had that atmospheric skip one. There were only 12 people who ever flew X-15s, just like there was only ever 12 people that walked on the moon. Yeah. There was only one guy who did both, and it was Armstrong. <laughs> he, who, who was an amazing pilot. Yes, and, um, although, and that incident about him skipping off the atmosphere is like one of those rare times where he didn't do absolutely everything perfect. There's a lot of debate, yeah, right. you know, how yeah. the hell did that even happen when you're talking yeah. about Armstrong? Armstrong, Armstrong was um, uh, not the best guy to for PR, and I think not yeah. NASA was very unhappy uh, about that kind of in the in in the long run. Yeah, but, um, you know, they had buzz. Like, it was the right two guys. You had the best pilot, flawless engineer. Like, yeah, perfect. Botches yeah. his line when he lands on the moon. And then Buzz gets out and says, magnificent desolation. And it's the best statement ever, now that anybody remembers it. Like, it, you, you got to have a, you need a tech, and you need a color yeah. man. And you got it yeah. in, in Buzz and, and uh, Neil. That's true. All yeah. right. So the, the fastest flight. Was a, it was a scramjet test. So in the 60s, they were trying to build supersonic combustion engines. Mm -hmm. right? Ramjets, good up to about Mach 5. They were trying to figure out, can you, you know, the concept of a scramjet engine was even possible then. So with ramjets, you still slow the air to subsonic to burn the fuel, which is why they sort of top out around Mach 5. Mm -hmm. Scramjet was his idea of let's not slow the air down that much. Let's stay supersonic flow right through the whole engine. And, uh, the best description I've ever heard from an engineer on this is try lighting a match in a hurricane. That's what you're trying <laughs> to do with a scramjet engine. So they mounted a scramjet engine on the ventral fin, so the bottom back near the engine. They were concerned that the in canal, the, the nickel uh, aluminum alloy that the aircraft's made of, could not handle those velocities. So they coated it in experimental ablative coating. It was a white coating. So you think about the time when they're doing this. It's in the middle 60s. So it's the middle of the space program. They've been building ablative heat shields for a while now. So they literally use a spray-on coating to cover the entire plane in white, including they coat one of the windows. So there's only two windows on this thing. They leave one uncovered, but the expectation was at this speed, that amount of heat... Mm -hmm. it's going to damage the window, right? It's going to end up, the ablation, the ablation material will cover, bury the window. So they put an explosive rope around the other window, not strong enough to blow the window one, but to blow the ablative shielding off. So when Knight had to land this thing, he would pop that, it would clear the other window, and then he'd be able to see a land. I'm just thinking about the balls it takes to get into this thing. It's like, let me get this. Yes! You, you may have a window to be able to see what's going on. So, yeah, and right. really they did two kinds of tests with X-15s. They did altitude tests, which helped them develop maneuvering systems out of atmosphere and do inter-atmosphere transitions. And they did speed runs. And speed runs were done at relatively low altitude. So this Mach 6 plus test, they thought they could have gotten to Mach 7, um, was done at about 100,000 feet. So your, your basic flight profile would be the B-52 would take you up to about 50,000 feet. You're hanging into the wing there. Then you're released. You lose about 10,000 feet getting the engine up and running. Then you accelerate upwards, climb at 4,000 feet a second. Uh, wow. <laughs> burn those tanks off. Level out at about 120,000 feet. Drop them. Put the spurs to it. See how fast you can go. Crazy. And the goal was to light the scramjet engine, the experimental scramjet engine concept, see if they could actually make it run. And Knight got to Mach 6.7. 
Uh, his original windshield was not badly damaged, so he was able to see out of it still. The explosive cord did work, but left enough debris that the window that should have been the one he could land with wasn't clear to really look through. <laughs> and he landed flawlessly, like Pete Knight did every damn time. Fabulous. I have then, Now, if you go find the footage of this, look at the state that the plane was in. So the downside to the ablative uh, material was that it radiated heat into the airplane anyway, not as much, but the Inconel is a high conductive material. So it normally sheds heat really well, but not when it's a coated in an epoxy resin. And so it actually overheated the entire airframe and burned it. The Ooh. scramjet engine melted. There's no other, if you see the pictures of it, there are holes in it. It was not <laughs> able to handle what they were trying to do. And they never did an ablative coating approach again. They just didn't understand the thermodynamics well enough. They were lucky they got the plane back. Wow. So I have, I have one more picture that's related to this um, that I just pulled up um, on the other screen. So I, that's why I was looking down. Um, this that's is the B-52. That's, that is the B-52, yes. So the this is the... The high and mighty one. Um, it's also the last B fifty two A remaining. Um, this is the number zero three means it is the third B fifty two that was ever produced. Wow. Yes. And so this is and the it's the last. Looks touched up, doesn't it? Like it's odd. The lines are almost too crisp on it. Yeah, no, no. It is. It has been touched up. So this sits in, in Pima at the Pima Air and Space Museum. Oh, okay. Uh, where do you live, Joe? Arizona. I live in oh, Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that is in that is uh, at the Pima Air and Space Museum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's at the Pima. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so and so that's uh, um, um, the B fifty two, and that is the third that was built. And this pillar, this pylon here. That is where the uh, X fifteen hung under. So they basically just put that. They, they mounted the plane under this pylon and then uh, flew it up to um, altitude. And then from there, it's, uh, they dropped it and started. And is this, this just a photo or is this a 360? No, that's just a photo. Okay. Because you, you can, can zoom almost, in actually, you almost see the blister on the, on the right side of the aircraft, which would be on the left, that, where they have a little bubble window so that the co-pilot can take a peek at the guy in the vehicle hanging under the wing. It's, it's yeah, I have. Give him thumbs up. Hang on, I have, uh, I, as I was looking for those, I had a better, I had one more picture. Um, I think this is what you mean. Hang on. It's coming, I just, I just need to navigate across. The there it is, yeah. This, right? Yeah, it's above it, actually. The, the roundel's up above. That, that blister looks like something else, but that's a window specifically put in so that they can get a look at the pilot. Uh, yeah. when they're hanging in that, that yeah, island. So the pylon is here, and then you also see all the markings for, uh, these These are from the, the X-15 uh, flights. Cool. So you can see captive ones, and then, um, you know, when they dropped in, and then they, when they, so they kind of marked them off differently. And powered, yeah. So you see one's pointing down, like, we dropped him, and he just went down. Yeah. <laughs> we <laughs> dropped him, and he went up. Yeah, he was just landing. We So, so... We were just trying to figure things out. We dropped and we landed. Yeah. And then we figured things out. And here we actually carries. went up. Yeah, the engine lit and worked. The high and mighty one. So yeah. that is also in uh, in Tucson. So they have kind of all kind of extra stuff here. In... Yeah, that did, you know that looks like a camera shelter, doesn't it? Look, see the little square lens on it? Yeah. Yeah, so it's probably a camera. That, that shot I mean, they, you see when they drop it, it's probably from that camera. I mean, they also did, they, they had a bunch of instrumentation also. Um, again, this is the uh, 1950s. There is a film camera, uh, uh, you know, behind that thing with a reel yes. of, uh, of film. The, uh, the film camera is not something that is, so, that is so foreign because the film camera is the reason why I don't have any pictures of me being 20. Neither do you. Because film. Because film. <laughs> and because we didn't keep them and because film was just damn expensive. Yeah. That's just what it is. All right. So we're back in the museum. Um, Where let's go. Huh? Where uh, 
Uh, I think we want to go and take a look at this, the, the white thing here. The white thing? What's the white thing? The white thing up here. The white thing up here <laughs> is... Um, this is your well, favorite airplane, Clemens. I know. You're in love with is, this. You have two books on this airplane. There it is. There it is. Um, it, it is. It. I think. I think the 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 American um, uh, aviation industry. Once they were done with their airplane, they just went into how do we save fuel? But that was uh, th th that is what remains of innovation. That's that's it. Ay, come on. The missile was going to win. That uh, was the problem, right? The missile was going to win. So this is the this is the North American um, XB seventy. Mm -hmm. uh, this was supposed to be um, America's bomber. Yeah, Mach um, three nuclear Mach bomber. Mach three bomber, yes. And so the the um, back in the Cold War, of course, um, the general idea of uh, of military aviation was to um, nuke nuke the Soviets. Um, and they've tried. They have multiple uh, um, attempts of um, uh, designing aircraft uh, to do so. They started with the B thirty six. Um, as a serious airplane, which was actually designed as the America bomber, we're going to get there um, eventually, hopefully. Um, and then they created uh, the B-47. We're also going to see that. And then they created the B-52, which still flies. Um, and this plane here was supposed to be the replacement of the B-52, like many other planes were supposed to be the replacement of the B-52. Um, none of them succeeded. And this one was effectively the pinnacle of the attempt to beat the Russians with an airplane that flies super high and super fast, that could basically outrun everything that the Russians could, could throw at it in terms of airplanes. So the idea was to um, create an airplane that could um, cruise at around just subsonic, just at Mach 0 .9, 0 0.9, and that could then dash into Soviet, into hostile airspace, but practically hot. Soviet airspace um, at, as fast as possible um, could then deliver the weapons and then which nuke him and then um, could um, um, you know leave at appropriate speed to save both the aircraft and the crew um, even though uh, with many of those designs and many of those tactics that were applied um, the um, safety of both crew and aircraft after dropping the bomb was never really a Not true certain. <laughs> yeah. Never a true concern. Um, so, so the the Air Force um, commissions uh, no, started a program, um, the the Weapon Systems One Ten A program, um, and uh, gave. The uh, uh, give it to various manufacturers, all the the, the, the common uh, companies that you might still know. Boeing was part of that, and um, uh, Lockheed was not yet part of that. But North American was also part of this, and ultimately, and this happened in 1954. So we're talking about going from propeller airplanes. In the Second World War, right, 45, um, we were still largely you know, having, looking at Air Forces, which had propeller planes, to the Air Force now saying, we need to have an, an airplane which can go at 70,000 feet at Mach 3.5. Um, and this was just when they were even, you know, when, 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 you know, supersonic supersonic flight was even just thought and, and proven to be possible. So 1954, 1957, North American got uh, the contract to go and build those. And then effectively as they were developing it um, into the early 60s, it was pretty clear that the idea of this airplane was, um, and that effectively flying high and fast, um, would no longer make sense because missile technology had developed to a point that uh, missiles were accurate enough 
to uh, make bombers basically obsolete or just a complement, and that that technology would just not be um, uh, would not make sense. So, nevertheless, so the program, the B seventy program, so the replacement program, basically for the B fifty two, was canceled completely. But there was so much progress being made for by North American on this aircraft that the Air Force said, all right, so we're gonna go and order three of those, um, which was then cut to two, and we're gonna fly them regardless in a pure research program um, as the XB-70, um, and um, that's what it ended up being. So when those, things, when those planes were built, there were two of them. Um, this one is the first one, and then the second one was also built, and that was uh, unfortunately lost in a terrible accident. Um, in flight test program. And actually, it wasn't a flight test accident. It was a photo op, right? Yeah. It was a photo op um, where, that was, uh, where that airplane was lost. Um, and um, Can you get a shot of the stern? Is there, is there a place where you can look back on the back of the aircraft? Yeah, yeah, you can. So we're going to walk around once because that's what, that's what we need to, that's when we need to go anyways. So we're going to go back here. All right, so this is the back of it. You can't really see this. It's the notice six engines, which is awesome, the six pack, but the wing tips on this uh, moved up and down. And yes. They, they learned about compression flight, creating additional wave riding by drooping the wing tips downward. The supersonic shock wave coming off of the inlet would bounce against that wing, those wing tips and actually provide more thrust for the aircraft. Correct. Yeah, there's tricks here that were learned that showed up on Concorde. Like it, it did teach yes. some amazing things. Now, do you know the MiG-25 story? Um, we should talk about the MiG-25 when we talk about the Blackbird. Well, we they're both both related. So yes. the okay. Soviet Union loses. They go. Well, that's true. You're right. Out. They're terrified of this aircraft. A Mach three. This is before their missile technology catches up. The Americans are going to build a Mach three bomber. Like, what are we going to do? So they set about to build a gigantic interceptor. The answer is get a pair of the biggest engines you can find, strap them to an airplane that can hold them, that can get close to Mach 3 to potentially intercept this insane bomber. Then American spies find out that the Soviets are building the greatest fighter plane ever made. It turned out to not be that great of a plane. But nobody knew that at the time. And they're terrified that the, the Soviets are going to build us a martial airplane. So they put a bucket of money into building the best possible fighter plane to respond to that fighter plane. And that ends up being the F-15. So if not, this bomber kicked off a technology race in fighter technology that leads to, one would argue, still the definitive best fighter ever made. Yeah. And and the the uh, the MiG the MiG twenty five and the MiG thirty three um, that were the response to this were. Um, uh, do you know how big those things are? Have you have you have you ever been yeah, there? No, I've one? stood beside one. They're eighty feet long. It's just it, it's they are they are huge. they are absolutely astonishing. Yeah, if I go on my if you allow me to go on my Flickr for a second. The, uh, the each engine is more than six foot in diameter. Like they're just, and you don't realize it till you sit it beside anything else. The MiG twenty five is insanely huge. Yeah. So, they, they but nice. it was just brute force. Right? The Soviets didn't have really sophisticated technology, but they knew how to make big things that were robust. And this was the ultimate interceptor. You you take off, you would blast off to altitude, you would fire your missiles at the incoming B seventy. And then you'd probably have to eject because you were out of gas. Yeah. So this is the Fox bat. It's 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 unfortunately there is no good reference point in this picture. If, it, in terms how of how small the cockpit is, like it's just it seems yes. toyish because it's tiny. It's yeah. It, that thing is just giant. And um, yeah, the the this is this this aircraft the fastest the fastest this was clocked at. Um, was over Lebanon, Egypt. I think. Yeah, it, it was during the Sinai Wars. Yeah, and, and they, it was, and they tracked it. And the guy just put the spur. You know, they were sitting up interceptors, and you saw the big guy just sort of turn away, 
put the Spurs here. I think it was Mach 2.8. Like, bye bye. Nobody's going to catch you. <laughs> so that is um, that is a result of that is a result this of this. Uh, that this only uh, two of them uh, ever existed. Yeah. N- you know, just basically an experiment. Yeah. Tell us why it's called the Fox Bat, Clemens. Yeah. Hmm? Tell us why it's called the Fox Bat. <laughs> It's it's called the fox bat because someone in NA- NATO decided that it should be. Yeah. But the, has, the whole the, the 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 initial code names, all the fighters were Fs. The fox bat, the yeah. flogger, the fulcrum. But, but those are the NATO. The, those are the NATO names. Yeah. 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 So, so not not the, so NATO basically got wind of of a new Russian fighter and then they just picked the name. Yeah. <laughs> um, and sometimes, sometimes it was a respectful one, and then sometimes it was just a, um, a name that was, uh, well, not quite as respectful. You're running out of F-words, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Richard, your, your picture is frozen, by the way. Yeah, it happens. I okay. Could prob- I could probably twiddle it, but I don't want to really interrupt the, the recording. All right, that's okay. So, so here we can, but we can see under the wing. Um, and you'll see that I can go with that, make this go away. Um, and you basically can see here that's the that part, yeah. that entire part here of that wing is uh, what comes what comes down to uh, um, form this. When did the picture go that I, that I showed? That I showed probably I just put that away. Yeah, um, with the wing tip. But you've, you've seen you've seen that. So basically, the the um, the the plane would if if those if those uh, wingtips come down, the plane then ends up riding on this uh, on the its own shockwave effectively. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, they those techniques would be used in the SR seventy one. Like we we this informed a lot. It was a worthwhile. Piece yeah, of it was a very worthwhile exercise. It was then used. Um, if, if if I go back once. Um, uh, So there's a picture and I'm not going to go and, and, and grab, but um, at some point, this was used, also used in the, SS, in the American SST program. Oh, yeah. So the supersonic transport program, which um, um, was supposed to create the American competitor for Concorde um, and was largely government funded and was so government funded that when the government stopped funding it, that Boeing fired everybody who was working on that program on the exact same day when the, when the funding was cut. Um, but so, so this plane was used in the SST program and was specifically used for um, figuring out the sonic boom effect. Um, so they, they flew particular routes and they were actually booming cities <laughs> as part of this program um, to figure out how the impact of that would be and uh, that was not good. And so what they did also in that program, they created uh, they they stripped the paint uh, the the paint off or the the signs off at some point, and made fake um, windows onto the fuselage. Oh man! As yeah. as a demo, effectively as a demo of how a XB seventy based SST could look like. So North American made an attempt, basically as they were setting this up, to also sell potentially this design as an SST, but obviously um, this ended up the the take. The, the maximum takeoff weight of this airplane is 550,000 pounds or something like this. And the Boeing SST, even though it's got the same size, was about 300,000. So um, much, much heavier because it was, it was built to carry um, atomic bombs, of course. The only, uh, they only ever made a wooden mock-up of that SST, but that mock-up still exists. I saw it in person once at the Hillier Museum in, in, uh, in California. Do you know where that sits now? I it's don't know. Last time I went to Hillier, it wasn't there anymore. It 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 uh, it is now closer to you. Oh, it is at um, the uh, the restoration center of the Museum of Flight at um, in Everett. Oh, okay, yeah, it is closer to me. So um, still across so, the border, I can't cross at the moment, but yeah, closer to me. <laughs> well, you know, so the the since we're talking about SST. Um, Oh, there's a piece of the mock-up. Here it is. Yeah. So, 
they have to store there and it's probably this those pictures are a few years old so yeah. maybe they have put it a little bit more together but i doubt it yeah probably but not. um they they only rec they effectively recovered the front section oh interesting okay um, this was this was the the mock-up was um uh on ex the full mock-up was on exhibit in florida um for a while and there was kind of an amusement park kind of set up and then um that went bankrupt and uh, they cut the thing into pieces and the only piece that went the piece the piece that went to the hiller museum was uh, just the front section yeah. and then the hiller museum needed space and they want to get rid of it and then the uh the museum of flight took it yeah it's probably but they don't know what to it's do it's probably with sitting yet. in storage well it's a failed well, project it's ultimately it, it's sitting it's sitting in that it's sitting in that um uh in that hangar right yeah in, in their restoration hangar and they don't know what to do with it yet there was talk about um having this um uh, be part of so there's all this the, the talk uh in seattle that keeps going on about the um uh, baseball uh bas basketball um team yeah. the supersonics and as they were talking about the arena that they would build for the for the sonics there was talk about having um the sst front section uh to be on exhibit in um the uh um in that um, in, in the new arena at some cool. point somehow all right what's next all right what is that what's next sorry um what time do we have oh we're um we only we only did three airplanes did we three airplanes uh, how about uh actually before we do this let's do this one the x3 let's do the stiletto uh, uh so um, beautiful uh, for what is largely a failed aircraft yeah, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. It's kind of difficult to see in this yeah. picture. Hang on, but I think I have one. I only show my pictures, obviously. Nice. You you have a better picture than the museum has of it, is what you're trying to tell me. No, I would, I'm not sure I would say that. <laughs> but, no. Come on. Oh, that's that wide span. That is a nice shot. So this one. Yeah. So you imagine this is the X3. So the X1 was the first thing to break the speed of sound. We won't talk about the D5551. The X2 is the sort of stretched version, both of which are captive carry drop vehicles for testing speed of sound. The X3 is, all right, Build me a Mach 2 aircraft that can take off from the ground and fly up to speed and return again. Like the ambition in a yeah. matter of a couple of years to go from a pure experimental captive carry vehicle to, okay, now build me one to fly. That's right. Except for that part where and, it didn't work. Awesome. And, and the, uh, uh, it's just, it's just an amazingly looking, like it looks yeah. fast. Yeah, it does. It really looks like like in, and this this whole the design of the windows and it just looks amazing and so the side the side view is astonishing and then um, and that's also why I took kind of this picture mm -hmm. um, so and, and it has kind of this Mickey Mouse appearance <laughs> from the front yeah the ears the ears um, which are the, the engine inlets um, looks fast unfortunately wasn't wasn't flew but uh, ended up as many air airplanes interestingly enough many airplanes end up being enormously underpowered for uh, their airframe design yeah. and so so was this so there are um uh, it's unfortunate that the x3 uh, even though it looked uh, totally badass um was ultimately not a great success so they they do you ever have any shots of the wing? Because the wing design basically informed the F-104. It's very much the same uh, kind of trapezoid wing. Yeah, you can see it kind of Super here. thin. It's super it's thin, high yeah. speed, But it's literally the same style. So yeah. one of the chief test pilots on this was Joe Walker. Name comes up again. And mm -hmm. one of the things they learned from this vehicle uh, was roll inertial coupling which is this insanely dangerous transsonic problem where 
you go to turn the aircraft and it basically starts flipping end over end. And he did it by accident once, recovered the aircraft successfully. They tried to understand what it was. So then he started doing it repeatedly, intentionally, because test pilots are insane. <laughs> right? That you basically, okay, go fly it again and lose control of it again. But it did teach us more about how to build aircraft that tolerated those transonic regimes so that when you tried to roll the aircraft, it didn't change, you know, change the pitch or change the yaw on the aircraft as well. Uh, Joe, Joe Walker is one of those astonishing test pilots. I mean, certainly he saw, solved that he worked through this problem. He was an X-15 pilot, but he was also the pilot of the F-104 that collided with the XB-70 and he lost his yes, life in that accident. correct. And then unfortunately died. Um, so we're going to back, go back to the museum and then we're going to turn around and we're going to look at this aircraft, which is, um, which is really remarkable. And you just, and this is one of those, like, if you're, once you're in that museum, you just walk by there and you're like, ah, oh, interesting nods. So it's so important that it's actually on the front of this book. Yeah. Um, it's and, one of a kind. Uh, there was only ever one made. Yes, there was just one made. So the one that's on here with a different um, paint job yeah. is the plane that is in the museum. And that is the XF-92A. And it is remarkable because, and you can see this actually on this picture, you can see this a little better. Um, because it has a delta wing. Mm. Um, and um, it has, it is the, the father of um, all kinds of different, like the elements that are in this, in this airplane are, uh, have found their way into various different um, designs. And it's um, the, the start effectively of uh, Convair's um, Delta, Delta fighters. You can see kind of, if you look at the, the sign here, yeah. all those pictures of, so this is the, the Delta shape. Um, what's interesting, and this is something um, you can see in the um, you can see in the book, um, but I haven't I haven't pulled up any sources for this. Is um, there was a the initial idea, the first design for this was um, the pilot would actually sit in the inlet. Right. Um, so the initial design looked completely different um, because ultimately the question here was, um, and this was one of the first fighters who did this. So let's, let's look at, let's, I mean, let's, let's talk about time here for a second, right? This aircraft first flew, and it, someone give me Eldert, guess. Eldert? Ah, give me a guess when, when, that when that airplane first flew. Sorry, one sec. Come again? What, when did that airplane first fly? Uh, a while ago. I can see that, but I'm not sure when. Guess. <laughs> uh, I, I really don't know. Like, 80s? 1948. 1948. Yeah, like I said, I really don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yes. But it's just, you know, it looks it looks vaguely old now, but it was so futuristic at its time. When yes. the guy, you know, fighters were still the, you know, the plane sitting beside it, that the the T eighty eight, that is, you know, right out of World War II first generation jet fighter. Correct. This was the experiment. Although there was a they pres pres proposed a combined cycle engine, right? jet fighter with rockets wrapped around it so that you would fire the rockets to accelerate uh, in flight, which is insane. Yeah. So do you have, you have the, the elements of the intake is in the front of the airplane. Mm -hmm. You have Delta wings, uh, which means there is no, you see this here. This is the, this is the other uh, groundbreaking aircraft of which, which probably f of which there are actually some derivatives flying. Sure. Um, this Still is the P eighty. Um, Originally the called the P eighty. Mm -hmm. Although, yeah, these days they're train. There are trainer variants and so forth. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. So this is a P eighty. Uh, let's talk about the, the 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 letters for a second. So F of fighters. Um, P stands for pursuit. Mm -hmm. 
So this is, so pursuit airplanes, so you know the P-51 and the P-47, and they're all P for pursuit airplanes. Um, and uh, those, the P designation um, was mostly used for prop aircraft. And well, then, it was the era, right? It's almost a byproduct of World War I, much less World War II, but the idea of yes. pursuing bombers. Correct. And um, then um, when, when no, the fight aircraft against aircraft became, became more of a thing, then um, uh, they in, introduced the designation F. And, uh, but it's really a, a split between the prop area, era and the jet area. And uh, so this is still called P-80. Um, as if it was a prop, um, I know that's called pursuit. Uh, but then the follow-up uh, models of that um, then were um, th there's actually an F designation for that as well, but I forget what it was. But still, it was, still, it was the F eighty, and then there yeah, was, that's and right. there was that's also right. trainer variants, so they called it the T eighty. T thirty three. Yeah. yeah. Well, it depends on the model. There was a bunch of different names. And there's a so so yeah. This this sparked a lot of uh, uh, offspring. Uh, but the designer of this was uh, Kelly Johnson, and we'll see some of his, his designs uh, in, in a moment. Mm -hmm. So we'll remember this plane because we're going to see um, offspring of that also. Uh, Jaeger uh, flew that plane, that very plane. This Chucky, one? Yeah, Chucky Jaeger. himself flew the 92. Yeah. yeah, no doubt. All right. Um, so let's progress. And... So here's another nice shot of the XB70. Yeah, on the other side. Um, Do you want to dig into the 107? Uh, yeah. Let's see what we see. Ah, uh, yeah. We should go. I didn't know whether that was a closer shot. shot. All right. So. Here's the 107. Nice and cool. 107. The 107 is a very odd looking airplane. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, it was. It was. Uh, the test pilots were slightly concerned about this aircraft. Well, you're going to eject into the inlet stream. <laughs> Let's think about that for a minute. <laughs> um, so uh, this was a. Uh, this was effective. So the the um, the uh, F one hundred and uh, um, was an, a result of the North. So North American built a bunch of bunch of aircraft um, that kind of followed onto each other. There was this F eighty six Saber, which was an aircraft that um, uh, was used in the Korean War, and that was kind of the first really competitive uh, jet fighter that the Air Force had. That then evolved into the F one hundred. Super Saber, and uh, which then ultimately evolved uh, into this thing, which was supposed to be the follow-up to the F-100. The F-100 has kind of this fish face. Yeah, um, and a, and, but still a nose inlet because the radars weren't that big yet. Yes, correct. Uh, but this, this one a, now, now... It was a competitive is, aircraft. Like This tried to compete for the fighter bomber role with the F-105 and the 105-1 and the 107 and lost. Yeah. And the so, test but the point, uh, but good point, right, that you're making is um, the radar. Mm -hmm. Because the prior airplane that we've seen um, didn't have any fun. So the, the, the uh, X, uh, XF-92 and some other plane, airplanes from that early era, especially also the F-86, they used the nose as the inlet, but then um, the nose became valuable real estate because you need to put the radar somewhere because in the direction of flight. So the inlets need to go somewhere else. They also and, learned that shorter inlets had advantages too, especially in supersonic flight. Yes. And that's something that's the shorter inlets. That's also something that is um, you know, easy to forget. Like what do we have on this other side? It's like a MiG-15 there. Well, we have to get... So let's, let's take a look at this one. That's uh, one of the swing wing prototypes, right? Like the... Yeah. X... Uh, no, Bill. God, what an ugly airplane. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also... That actually, this actually shows us pretty well. All of... 
what the, all the what those fighters are, they're basically just engines with some skin around it. Yeah, wings and a cockpit strapped on. Yeah, and but all of this, like basically, the the engine starts here and then goes all the way basically to to the end, and that's the same is true for these here. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is the inlet, and then the engine starts here, and then the rest of that that plane is engine. So they're typically full of engine if you if you want, and which was different for props. And so here, for, for, so here, they you have a shorter inlet inlet because it only starts here, um, and then the rest of this airplane from here on, effectively to the back, is all engine. These engines are humongous. Um, so, funny looking airplane. The interesting the, the the thing it will be remembered mostly for is this weird choice of putting the inlets at the top that has never been done again. Pretty much. Um, but um, this is also the very this is where they started experimenting with variable, variable geometry inlet. That is right. Yeah, and it, that and so if you get a good study of that inlet design, you'll see the same design on the F fourteen, on the F fifteen, modern flow technologies. When you talk about F twenty two, F thirty five, it's different now. But this is the beginning of that. Even the the XB seventy benefits from the inlet design that came from the one hundred seven. Mm -hmm. And that's you can see that right here. The, the inlet design is a super complicated thing um, for anybody who has not thought of that at all because um, you have and all of these, th those are supersonic aircraft. And uh, you can't run supersonic air through in, in, an engine, so you have to go and slow it down. Okay. And uh, these, these inlets are effectively shaping the airflow so that um, it has the optimal velocity um, uh, ultimately to um, 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 no, to make to make it all work. So, how how about we talk about what's the time? Well, we're doing pretty well. Yeah, yeah. I'm in no particular rush. No, is that the YF twelve? I mean, mm -hmm. it looks like an SR seventy one from here, but if you get a good yeah, we're gonna we yeah. Uh, there's there, actually, there is no good angle, which is really weird, from the front um, okay. using okay. using those pictures. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna I'm gonna resort to mine. Okay. Where is, um, and I gotta think everybody here knows the SR seventy one, but there were three different airplanes made that were off that design. And four. I would argue this one. The, the YF is the rarest. Uh, yes, it is the rarest. So, but it is the YF-12. Mm -hmm. Richard, do you know what the difference is between the SR-71 and the, and the A-12? And the, a, and the A-12? Yes. Well, it's ownership for starters. Yes. Uh, uh, you go, what do you want to say? <laughs> so the, uh, so this is, this is, this is a derivative of the A12, actually, and not of the SR71. The SR71 was, the, the, they're all, they're all um, cousins. Yeah. Um, but the A12 was the first, the first one. The A12 was developed originally for the CIA. So it was not an Air Force project, but the CIA said, we need to have an, a spy plane that can outrun um, all, the, all the Soviet um, uh, aircraft, so they commissioned the A-12, which was a super, 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 super secret project. Um, and then uh, eventually, the uh, when that had proved itself, um, this flew also um, three over three times the speed of sound. Um, the um, Air Force then wanted to have, basically wanted to take over that mission, um, but that said, we want to have a um, aircraft that has two seats. A-12s were, were flown solo. And we also want to have an airplane which has a bit, of, bit more range. And we want to have flexible mission capability. So the SR-71 has exchangeable um, noses. There's four different kinds of noses that you can mount. Um, and all the sensors are in the nose of the, of the SR-71. While with the A-12, all of the uh, mission capabilities are in the at the bottom of the fuselage, and the the nose actually has um, has a radar 
but um, it's not um, used for for uh, for the mission paper, mission capabilities. What they did here is they effectively took the A12 and put a um, radar into the nose that was for interception. And so this the YF12 was meant to be America's. It, it's one of the attempts um, at uh, um, uh, at America at America having a super super fast interceptor. Right. Um, one of very many attempts. We're going to see a few more um, later. Um, so just just for those who don't know what an interceptor does, the so generally the 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 threat to the United States as it was perceived back in the days, so in the late fifties, beginning of the sixties, was that there would be a large number of bombers um, come you know towards America. They would be able to go and detect them um, as they come in, um, and then. The idea of the interceptor is that you can you basically run at the uh, at the bombers and you intercept them while they are far away from your, from your territory. So interceptors were stationed in or fighters with interceptor roles were stationed in Europe, were stationed in uh, at the shorelines of the United States, and were were stationed uh, up in Canada, um, quite a few, um, and with various different aircraft taking on that role. Um, and the idea here, because there was a Mac three aircraft um, available, design available, was the idea was to turn um, also this um, the A twelve SR seventy one into um, a fighter. Um, there was um, so this was the attempt. Um, this was um, a proposal, effectively that was initiated by Lockheed um, and then tested in that role. Um, ultimately, not successful. Um, and um, the the uh, the model the the YF twelve model that would have flown would actually have looked more like that, like the original SR seventy one um, by having these shines here uh, extend effectively really through to the nose. So this was effectively just the the this, the, the the nose here without these shines that usually are characteristic for the SR seventy one and A twelve. It would have uh, stretched to the front, just like they do with others. I'll just show you that. So with an SR-71, um, probably not the right album to open, hang on. Um, but I know exactly which picture, I'm, this is the picture I'm looking for. So you see that these, these extensions here, they're not part of the fuselage, the core fuselage is here, but these extensions here are called shines and they are effectively part of the wing system. Um, and so the nose of the YF-12 would in the end have looked somewhat like this. Um, so that's kind of a temporary state of affairs to have it look like that, but that's a- and They were also good for heat radiating and they were relatively stealthy. Yes, they were they were quite stealthy. Even though that was not an initial um, design goal or an explicit design goal, they ended up being uh, quite stealthy. Yes, All, I mean also because they had, they flew at, at fairly extreme altitudes. Yeah. Um, so that's the Blackbird. One of the one of the four types of Blackbirds. Um, the one that sits in so if you have been for those who have been at Seattle at the Museum of Flight. There is a SR-71 at the Museum of Flight, or sorry, a Blackbird at the Museum of Flight. Um, so I used to, uh, I used to watch the SR-71's uh, Habus taking off from Okinawa, from Kadena, the Kadena oh, wow. Air, Air Force Base there. Uh, when these things launch at night, I just dropped a link there into the Pinterest. The, it's hard to put into words uh, what a sight it is to see these at night with these just like big pillars of plasma colored the shock cone. Uh, yeah. gas coming out of the coming out of these things on takeoff. They're really a sight. Yeah, I we they, I put they brought one. It's in the, the uh, I put a average. picture in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm 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 pulling it up. Uh, they yep. brought one to the Abbotsford Air Show once, and we got to see it take off. And it's just the violence, the force of the thing was astonishing. And it's an enormous machine. 
Yes. Yeah. The, yeah, that, the people perfect. in Okinawa, they were really proud of this plane when it used to be stationed there. And that's why it's called the Habu, which is a, uh, a poisonous snake indigenous to Okinawa. Nice. The, there is a, there is a, um, a tanker, uh, KC-135T, and the T model has been created specifically, and they are still, they are still around because they have been re-engined. Um, and so the T models are all the SR-71 tankers, and they have special tanks um, for JP-7, which is the, the fuel that was specifically created for um, the, the Habus. This here is the one that is at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. Um, and that is not, it, so that is an A-12. Um, so it's not an SR-71. People think it is, um, but it's an A-12. But it's more precisely, it's an M-21. Um, wow, they had the drone. Because it has it's the drone. It has the drone sitting on top of it. So this is the only survive. There were there were two. This is the only surviving one, and it has the drone uh, the drone sitting on top of it. So this was a mother. They have one of those drones at. They have one of those drones at Pima. Yes, there are there are um, there are six or seven of those um, spread around in various museums. Um, so there, there are, there, they are actually fairly. They are more frequent than um, than the SR seventy ones are. Actually, there is one of those um, right here. Yeah. So, yes. Well, it, it was a belief that they there were going to be places that the SR seventy one couldn't overfly, so they were going to use the drone to go on by itself to to fly. But it turns out, separating stuff at Mach three is bloody dangerous. Yes, it also it was not a it was not a resulting success. No, at all. Well, but you know, you people talk about drones now. It's like, <laughs> you know, these little quadcopters. You call that a drone? Yeah. You know the the lucky the D twenty one like that is a drone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mach 3.3, 3, 90,000 foot um, yeah. operating ceiling. Yes, that's a drone. That is a drone. So, um, and now, the, so when, so I was, when I was at the museum for the first time, um, it was hard to take this thing seriously. It's hilarious, right? I like the name Alien School Bus. I think it's a good description of it. <laughs> it it's so, amazing. Yeah. It, it is, it is, it is a completely astonishing thing. And I think there is a better view of it um, here, here. So, so this is what it looks from the top. Yeah, that uh, inlet. It flies. That inlet is is quite astonishing because I mean that's that is that is clearly not obvious yeah, how that can, thing even. Where breathes. is the engine? You know, like you're looking yeah, at it. Where going, is the where? engine? How? <laughs> how? How does this work? And what is this for? And why would someone build a school bus that flies? Um, but you know what? You sit that beside a B2 and everything makes sense. Yeah. Because it's Northrop, right? This is Northrop's uh, experimental vehicle. And so, and it was about yep. geometrically diverse stealth. And uh, it, it, when you sit beside a B2, you're like, there you go. Okay, I see the lines. Yep. You see, you see all the... the and, and everything that they learned about stealth from it went into the YF-23. So if you look at the YF-23, you know, when you look from the top view, you see that all the exit gas is in a, in a in channel that kind of wash. Um, in that same kind of wash so that it's basically invisible to ground-based infrared. Now, yeah. now that you mention that. <laughs> so beautiful. Nice. And those tail fins too, like just the so, geometry of this thing is gorgeous. And the, the, um, the bubble where you see that for the engine, that actually would have been much smaller, much sleeker, except a, at one point the Air Force had insisted on reverse th including reverse thrust. And so that what makes it a bit ungainly. Hmm. This is, this so is would Richard, have been even sleeker. This is Richard's favorite airplane. Uh, I see pretty, pretty close. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to resist this plane and God. What because, could have been? I, and they I, did have designs the, too for a variant where they get rid of the, the tail fin. Yeah, yeah, could have gone that way. Uh, there was the proposal to make it into a bomber. 
because mm-hmm. it's big. Like it, it, I have a the other description, a, the version I've heard of this story is that even the, the Air Force was looking, going, love it, but it's going to be another F fifteen. Like it's going to be so expensive, not even we can afford it. Well, you're going to go with the cheaper option. Well, they, I think they also went for the option. They, I think skewed because of Air Force, it skewed towards this, you know, this notion of dog fighting, right? You know, right. like a, extreme maneuverability, which is a, honestly a bit of a crock. Like, you know, when was the last time uh, anyone shot each other down from within visual range? Sure. Well, the, and you uh, look at how they're actually using the F-22 where it's just invisible. Nobody knows where the heck it is. Right. It, yeah. So what is the dogfight ability? And, yeah. And the F-22, it, its stealth abilities aren't even in the same ballpark as, as the YF-23. Yeah. And the YF-23, you know, super cruise with no afterburners, uh, it, longer range, faster. It just beats it on every metric yeah. uh, except for that dogfight and the fact that they didn't do the grandstand thing during the test of doing, you know, live weapons drop right. during the uh, bake-off. I think Northrop culturally failed many times on exactly that sort of thing. They were never a grandstanding company. They, they had certain classes mm-hmm. of technology they were extraordinary at, and you see that here, but they never grandstanded the way a Lockmart did. And kind well, of reflective of yeah, Jack Yeah, they Northrop were lucky himself, with sh- right? Yeah, the F, the uh, but the F twenty two is great to make photos of. It has that going for it. Yeah, <laughs> it is very pretty. I mean, you can you can the uh, let's see. Yeah, I I just look at it as such a lost opportunity that yeah. you know if we had gone with this and then think of all the variants you could make from this, and for the kinds of situations we have today, you know, it had, you know more payload, better stealth, more range, uh, oh. super cruise with, without afterburner. Yeah. yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's and sh- it should have won because it's just a better, it's just a better aircraft. Yeah. But, you know. Well, anyway, anyway so. And then, was- and then, and then, so then we get saddled with the F-22 and but then they decide oh the f-22 is too expensive so we're going to make the f-35 which is just a dog and now we're like damn it i wish we had made more f-22s yes so it's like if you're gonna gonna feel bad about it you should have made more but we barely got f-22 you know we didn't field a a large enough uh fleet of f-22 and and now we're saddled with f-35 which nobody wants yeah, it's, it's, it's the thing that uh, makes nobody happy, unfortunately. Um, so that was, that was the, uh, the research gallery, at least the ones that we picked from, the, from that gallery. And then um, we're going to skip the missiles, even though they're interesting. Wow. There's only so much time, right? We're, we're... There's so much, only so much time. And so we're going to go here. But not this oh, look, view. a UFO. Nice. The arrow. I don't know why, why that car is here, but I would suggest that we start. Um, how do we get close to the P36? P36, yes. By probably looking. Because it's the oldest of the bunch. Yeah, it's, exactly. So it's a logical, logical best start. I just need to go and see which camera is the best one for it. Probably this one. Oh, Hustler. Yeah, we got to talk about that. And we're going to get to the Hustler in a second. Yeah, so this is... The size of this thing. I have a fantastic photo of that in my own collection, so I'm going to go pull that up. Of that exact, of that, of that exact airplane. Um, and that is in... I have a bunch of B-36 photos, as you can probably tell, um, of all four that exist. I just, I'm just looking at, a, I'm just looking for a particular one. Let's see, this should be quicker. There, that is the view I want. Oh, down the way. <laughs> I sent you a picture of that when I was at Pima, and you said, "Oh, they moved it." <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. 
um, six pusher propellers and four jet engines that were added um, with the B model or D model. Yeah. D model, I think. Yeah. Um, and a giant bomber that only had the mission of hauling enormously large nuclear bombs, which you can see down here. Now, the original, when they were specking this airplane out, because it's, again, from the 40s, they didn't, mm -hmm. they didn't know there were nuclear bombs at that point. That is right. Yeah. yeah. So this they was... They had this... specked out a 20 metric ton conventional explosive for it. The, so the, the, the design of this, so this was commissioned in 1942. Um, and the goal of this, so the, for, in 1942, the Americans were just justifiably, and this was in the beginning of 42, were justifiably worried that um, the the Brits may be um, we're uh, overrun by the Germans. Yeah. And um, in that case, they would have no aircraft carrier um, to fight the Germans because it was pretty clear that they could not stay out of this. So even before they got into um, uh, into the middle of it uh, in Europe, they um, said we need to have a bomber that can fly from the United States to Germany, uh, fly uh, air raids, and they can come back. So this was effectively designed as a you know fly to Amer fly fly to Germany bomb Germany bomber, um, with the 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 technology of of the time, and it was meant to then fly in 1946 or so. That was the idea that would fly them. But that was the, 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 the idea and the order was done in the war and then um, they changed the effect of the mission profile um, after the war. And then as nuclear weapons became available and then of course, hydrogen bombs became available, yeah. which you can see the big ones down here, then um, that became the mission. Those things are- Do they have a model aircraft. of the Mark 17 down there? Yeah, they have, yes, they do. And that, uh, that was the joke, like as much as they didn't have a plan, they didn't know how big a hydrogen bomb would be. And then when they finally got one working, it's like, well, it's 20 metric tons. Can you drop that? It's like, well, we have one airplane that can drop that. Yeah. Actually, you um, can carry two of them, which is ridiculous. I think I also have that label, let's see. Because they, they, sit, they sit down there in the cluster. Um, ooh, I don't We may have actually, so in here, we may be actually be able to get close to them. <sighs> Which are we are we looking? No, not from here. No. Um, maybe from here. The side with that wheel. Yeah, it's it's giant single wheel landing trucks. Like just yeah, um, we'll we'll talk about that in a second. Then. Oh, there's a good is that one? Yeah, I, there's a so this is the Mark Forty One. Oh, uh, it's much newer. Yeah, that's much newer. Very compact. Very compact. And here it is. Yeah, Mark Seventeen. Mark Seventeen. Holy man. It is enormous. Yeah, twenty metric tons. Yes, and that's why that's why the plane would, so they could so the B thirty six could carry two of those. <laughs> I don't think you get away from them though. Um, well, they were they were thrown out from very high altitude, and then they just needed to have some time yeah. uh, to get away from them. But mm -hmm. yeah, they were yeah. substantial. They were quite substantial. Um, yeah, so this wheel here is um, rather interesting. So this is these are the wheels that were that, that ended up being on the B thirty six, but this was the wheel that was on the XB thirty six, the the initial uh, uh, prototype, the giant wheel approach, the giant wheel approach, which and then 
um, nobody had built an aircraft of that size mm -hmm. until then. So, and and if you look at all the B, all the the other airplanes of its a of its time, the B twenty nine and the B seventeen and B twenty four, they all just had you know a giant wheel, giant set of wheels on the back. Right, yeah. that was yeah. the design. So, so the, the, the idea of splitting the load across multiple wheels as it is common today, um, you know, across those, those trucks, um, was invented for this aircraft because it was just too large. Yeah, to try and, and get um, they had, um, uh, um, there was also, there was an approach um, to put um, actually tracked wheels under it because I they saw that they, picture and you're like, ah, it's crazy. Okay, <laughs> you're nuts. Um, and uh, so they, they designed this first as kind of with the, with the notion of, well, we're just going to scale the idea up and, and made, this, made this thing, which is taller than I am. Um, it's, it's like two meters, two, something like, or it's over two meters high. And um, uh, then they did some calculations of how many airstrips in the United States would actually be able to deal with the load. And so they only had three of them that uh, could actually, actually take the pressures, take the pressures yeah. um, and nowhere else. So that became somewhat impractical. Um, and so they had to go and figure out a new way. And so the B-36 was like every aircraft, large aircraft that you know today um, has these track wheels like the B, the, the A380 and the A, um, the B, uh, B747, um, they all, you, you know that they have these, uh, um, uh, you're familiar with that they have these uh, kinds of wheels and, um, or track wheels. And, but they were, they were invented for the B36. The B36, one of the, the weird, obviously the weird ways of, um, the, the weird look, um, let's see what I can go get back to that picture um, here. Uh, the weird part of the design here is the pusher props, um, because they that's certainly unusual, and uh, that also caused quite a bit of problems, because they were using engines um, that were designed to be um, mounted um, the with propeller forward yeah. the other way around. And air being forced into them. Yes, air being forced into them from the front. So they had all kinds of weird engine problems with those, uh, including the carburetors freezing up, uh, just just because the air was coming from the wrong direction. Um, and um, uh, and then the jet engines were also uh, unreliable. So um, there was uh, a so this is six six uh, turning, four burning was the. Uh, um, uh, the catchphrase, right, for this airplane. Um, so six propellers, uh, four jet engines, and there were then sayings of um, uh, two burning, uh, no, uh, two turning, two burning, two on fire, two smoking, and <laughs> two unaccounted for. <laughs> um, so they were not. They were not a, an example of. Uh, Reliability. But there's no way these things would have survived modern AA. Like, it's the end of an era kind of thing. It's yeah, like, I mean, this is, this is why they were. Sense. They built these giant airplanes, and uh, by five, by 1959, all of them were gone again. Yeah, like they literally put all of them except for four into the shredder. Yeah. There are or five. There are now. There are. There were five available through time. Um, one of them had been bought by a person in, in somewhere in I forget where it was. Was it Confederate? Somewhere in New England. Okay. No, someone someone actually put a a, a part of a, a, a mostly complete B thirty six into his backyard. That's a big backyard. Yeah, it's a substantial backyard. So he was a, um, a Soplata is his name. Um, so, so Plata B36. I think so Plata was his name. 
Yeah, he had the YB36. So, <laughs> you know, as you do. As you do in his backyard. It looks like an aircraft crash site. <laughs> yeah, but he, he had intent. So he had intentionally, in Ohio, he had uh, intentionally hauled all that shit into his backyard as his collection. I presume he's not married. Uh, yeah, I think he. I think he was married because there were there were people talking to his wife after his passing. Okay. Uh, so he had the YB it. the YB thirty. Well, he had the YB thirty six sitting in his backyard. That's hilarious. So that was the fifth, the fifth, and then there's now there are four of those four B thirty sixes remaining. Um, this one, um, B thirty six J. Then there's another J in Pima, um, Tucson. Um, there is another J in um, Ashland, Nebraska, at the uh, Strategic Air, Com Air Command Museum, and then there is an RB um, 36H, um, the last H model, um, that is at the Castle Air Museum in um, California. Wow. And that's it. And I have, I have photos of all of them. And it's literally the transition, right, between jet and prop. Like it's it's just this in between yeah. airplane. There's great stories yeah, right. about they they put the original version had turrets, but they were pop up turrets, and they used 20 millimeter guns. But because they were using vacuum tube technology, every time you fired the guns, you shook the vacuum tubes out. <laughs> you know, they they almost lost aircraft because they would test the guns, and all hell would break loose inside. So there's another there's another um, example of that hybrid setup here. Um, I don't know whether you've seen that, but that's that the KC on? the KC ninety seven. Oh, okay, yeah, Stratofighter. So the KC ninety seven is um, effectively a uh, double decker version of the B twenty nine or B fifty, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, and. Um, so same engines, same wings as the B-29, but as a double-decker. Um, that was initially designed as a freighter plane and was then um, uh, mostly used as a tanker for quite a while. Um, and and uh, it had um, also jets, and it got jets because it had to catch up with um, jet, jet air, aircraft. Hmm. Um, and uh, it was... Um, one reason, one reason for the urgency to phase it out and then replace it with a KC-135, so the Boeing 707 um, uh, later, was um, that it just could not, it just could not fly enough. So it would kind of, the jet airplanes would be f flying near stall speed and right. uh, the KC-97 would fly as fast as it could. So to, to speed it up a little bit, they put the uh, jet engines Hilarious. Uh, under it. So that's the, the other example of um, mixed, of a, a mixed setup. Yes, that's that's right here. But fifty-eight or the forty-seven. Hmm. Is it the fifty-eight or the forty-seven? Uh, we're gonna go to do the forty-seven first. Part. Yeah. That's from a that is more logical. So this is the forty-seven from the back, and here's the forty-seven from the front. Yeah, that and, famous uh, Jado takeoff picture. That's what that one reminds me of. That tipped up look. Yeah, um, that I'm sure that there are a hundred a hundred copies of Flickr. Yeah, Just pure mad this. violence. <laughs> <laughs> Proof that if you strap enough rockets to anything, you can make it go faster. Yes. Well, that was also a function of those those jet engines were so these 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 turbojets were yeah. enormously sluggish. Yes. In perf. But you can and see so they the have... B fifty two in here, right? Those the the dual truck landing gear, the twinned engines, like all the elements are here. Yeah. Of what it's will become clearly the precursor. But it's it's also so it's it's remarkable in 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 a number of ways. Let's see how the uh, See, so it's remarkable in a number of ways because this is the father of all the aircraft that we know today, like the, all the civil, all the civil aviation aircraft that we know. Mostly, all are following the B B forty seven design. Um, swept wing so, jet aircraft at the bomber scale. 
Yeah, it has so swept wings. Um, that was a, that was the first aircraft of that size who picked up the uh, the swept wing um, uh, idea. And then most uh, most notably the potted wing design. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the potted, potted, the potted engine. engine design, um, where the the engines this it doesn't seem noteworthy. Like this this looks completely normal today, but that was that was the the ultimate innovation here. Yeah. Other aircraft of its time, um, if you look at all the Brits um, and how the, the, the Brits designed their aircraft, the, the Comet and then the Victor and like all of their V-Force aircraft, they yeah. all had the, the engines in, embedded into the wing um, and uh, Boeing here really broke new ground with uh, putting the uh, um, engines in pylons, which, which made maintenance much easier yeah. uh, for fl very flaky engines. Um, and um, also made the entire wing um, uh, cleaner and easier. Uh, yeah, there's always a trade here of efficiency. If you bury it in the wing root so that you don't have as much drag from the nacelle, but then you have all the maintenance problems, and the wing itself is draggier because it's so bulky uh, when, yeah. you, when you move down the nacelle. And then, of course, that leads to the turbo fan, where it's like, and now we can stick a great big rotor on the front, which is far more efficient because we have room under the wing hanging under off a pylon. That's right. And so, so just for reference, um, God, what a funny looking airplane. The Brits build the weirdest things, the weirdest planes. Look at that thing. It, this is this this is the space alien. Yeah. This th and you this is tacit this, blue was weird. Look at this. <laughs> this it is it is it is really 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 strange. Look at that. And the Nimrod, which was the you know, the later version of the yeah, not the, not the Victor but the Valiant. Like Japanese anime, like Valley of the Wind. Yeah, absolutely. What were you this thinking? Yeah, I mean, this is this, but but this looks. So you know what looks it looks unreal. like? It looks like the Caspian Sea Monster. Yeah, yeah, right. It's a ground yeah. effect vehicle. It, um, but it's it's uh, uh, it looks this looks like from a science fiction movie. Now the one I love, uh, the Vulcan of the V series. The Vulcan's the beauty. And so the, here's the Nimrod. Is that's direct? You know, this is when nobody would fly a comet anymore. The UK military bought them up and made them into to observer aircraft. That's correct. Yes, and the Vulcan is obviously fantastic. The Vulcan's beautiful, and there's a flying version of it. And no longer, uh, they had to uh, um, they had to give it up. Yeah, um, yeah, but it's uh, the, this one is, is just beautiful. It is fantastic in an old way. Pure, it's still it's buried pure, in the wing roots, right? Like just the the challenge of all of that. And did and those so, make it all the way to Falkland? With refueling, yes. yes. Oh God! So that's a whole that's a whole that's a whole giant. This that's a story to talk about, and that is one that you can go and research. Yeah. And it's an astonishing yeah. story. So they flew this with 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 um, uh, with Victors. So that one that we just previously looked at. As tankers and these as bombers, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they had this this scheme where they were flying in a formation, and uh, the the victors were the tankers, and the, the and they had only had like a handful of, of Vulcans, and the victors would would fuel each other. They were the they were the, the tanker aircraft, and they would also fuel the Vulcans. So they had to kind of figure this out so that the victors would then peel off the formation over time um, so that the, Vic the Vulcans could then get to the Falklands and then get away again. It, it was because none of, none of the aircrafts even had remotely the range. So they had to figure yeah. this out in a, um, it's, it's an astonishing yeah. story. They did it with brute force and so, lots of money. Um, so during, in the spin up to the Falkland War, um, I lived at the military base in Puerto Rico, uh, Roosevelt Roads, and our house was on a cliff looking out at Vieques Island, which is the, the US Navy's bombing range. 
and mm -hmm. the entire British Navy came there to practice on their way to the Falklands. And wow. so at night, the Harriers would come in and they would drop these magnesium flares on chutes that would light up the entire island like a football stadium. And then they would just start bombing and pounding and it would make the windows of our house shake with every explosion. The windows would pop in and then back out in wow. and then back out and so my dad and i were sitting in the backyard in lawn chairs we're just like hanging out watching he's having a beer we're just watching <laughs> we're just watching them doing bombing practice and my dad turns to me and he says well i wouldn't want to be argentinian right about now <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna like what happens next yeah no no yeah so um, so back to the to B forty seven. So this is this was the successor of the B thirty six. So all jet, um, built for nuclear weapons. Just built. And it had no. It was never used in anger because it had no mission other than you just use nuclear nuclear weapons. Even though, not 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 exactly true because this here is an Lock RB, right. is an RB um, uh, forty seven. It's spy plane. And the, and the RB-47 have flown reconnaissance missions over Eastern Germany and the entire Eastern Bloc in anger. So they actually flew with the B-47s. They flew um, unopposed for a long time um, through uh, the entire Eastern Bloc into photos. So that was, so it was, it's, it's, its primary role is a bomber, and that's kind of what it is known for. But the RB versions were the ones which were actually the, I would say, had the most heroic missions. The most useful because, anyway. um, they, 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 yeah. Go ahead. They did an electronic warfare version of this as well. Yes. Yes, there's an EB, there was an EB, EB-47 as well. Um, the last one flew in sometime in the 80s, in, in 1988. They had one that was sitting somewhere in, uh, in storage for a super, super long time. And uh, they restored it and flew it from one place to a museum. So um, cool. after it had been sitting, so there had been no flight for, for, for 20 years. And then they just resurrected one, flew it from one place to the next. And that was the last one. Awesome. Um, yeah. So There's not a lot of airplanes you could restore it after sitting that long. And practically no and and so now now you obviously could not uh the the one that sits at the museum of flight in seattle has been sitting outside for um so long 50 years has been sitting sitting there at, at boeing fields since the 60s wow always outside and only just recently got moved under a roof um, and that is so terribly corroded that it's uh, just about to fall apart. So um, they're, um, uh, they need to do something to, uh, to keep it together. Um, and now, now we can go and take a look at that. Uh, I think this is my childhood favorite airplane, like of, of uh, making models and things. I think it yes. was the Hustler that was the one because it just now, looks fast. It looks fast. It looks fast. It's just sitting there. It it looks fast. It's it's an it's an amazing it's an amazing amazing aircraft. Yeah. But this is uh, this is the practical version of the B seventy. Okay, let's build a dash bomber that we can yeah. actually build. And it was it was the um, it was used as the chase plane for the XB seventy program. Yeah. Because that's the only one that could keep up with it. Um, the uh, we should go and take a look at the. What's what's evil about this thing is it's a bomber with a bomber's flight range and time, but you're sitting in like fighter pilot seats. There's three people in there, one behind the other. Yes. And you can't get up. You know, all the other bombers, you can at least move around. Yes. Uh, there are. Uh, there should be a picture of. Well, there's only the one. So the canopy is open to the front, and there's like three uh, behind each other. Yeah. And so, so all those guys are basically just stuck in there. And uh, uh, we're talking about you know missions that go that's 
you know, start in the U.S. and then go all the way across the Atlantic and go all the way towards the Soviet Union. Yeah. And they would actually go and try them. Um, you know, not go into the Soviet Union, but they would go far enough. And so um, you had these three guys sitting there for hours and hours and hours and hours kind of in their, in their little compartment. With a pea bottle. A, yeah, I mean, sure, they had a pea bottle. There was a, they, they had a, um, here's a, picture that's a, that's another view that's the one that sits in Pima um, the uh, um, this thing here is not part of the airplane this part is and you see this also in our original here that's the this that is the 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 pod as it's called that is detachable um, and that is uh, special for every mission and uh, for most missions um, because this is also a nuclear bomber, of course, there are two nuclear weapons in here and extra fuel. And so the idea was to, um, you know, dash into um, territory, go and drop your nukes and, uh, you know, be done with the fuel, drop the, the pod and then dash home. Um, there is a there there is a, a, a an ebook that I read and that I still have, but that disappeared from Amazon weirdly, hmm. um, which is written by an ex B fifty eight pilot, which is um, um, talking about a, a you know a real nuclear like the nuclear mission that they trained for. Um, I, I think his description of the way how they got out of the like the post attack description is a little optimistic oh yeah there's a lot of that <laughs> sort of optimism. Um, uh, and by the way here this is also noteworthy you think of ejection seats usually yeah um that cut the, the pilots sit in and then they they uh, you know they pull the handle and then the seat ejects here they have these um, escape capsules. That's a feature that exists in this aircraft and also in the XB-70 um, and also in the F-111. Uh, the F-111 had the whole crew compartment. It, yeah, in a, in, a, in a more extreme fashion, exactly. Yeah. And Although, uh, I think all of these things are largely failures. Like if you read the crash report yes. for the B-70, the, the pilot never got out. I don't know if it's malfunctioned, he couldn't close it properly, but the co-pilot, he got his arm stuck in the shutter. And so then right. he's fighting to get his arm out. He finally pops his arm out. And the moment the arm comes out and the thing clicks down, boom, he's out. Yes. And then he's so stunned, he never deploys the airbags. And so he hits the ground at like 50 Gs. He lives. But, you know, there's sort of this consideration of these are too complicated. Like, yes, it's too complicated of an idea and it's uh, largely a failed, a failed idea. Well, they didn't put him in the SR-71, which flew even faster. They just put him That's in full right. pressure suits which sucks in its own way to be in a whole pressure suit, but for, for those long duration flights where now you can't even pee in a bottle, but, but we can you go, don't we need can go, the, We can go all the way over to the other side and see just the uh, yeah. that idea. But so even the regular ejection seats are not without peril. You know, my oh, no, father, when he die. got shot down in Vietnam, he punched out at uh, 400 knots and the, uh, he separated from the ejection seat and the ejection seat came back and hit him in the air, uh, ripping his kneecap out and uh, breaking all his ribs and a few other things. Ejecting um, is not And then they put idea. him back together again and sent him for a second tour in Vietnam. Holy man. <laughs> wow. So here's the, what you just talked about. Yeah, the ejection uh, so this And this looks like a spark bark too. I'm looking at the. I'm looking at the tail. Hmm? Do you see that blister on the top of the tail? This is the electronic warfare version of the. Yeah, F1 this is, yeah, exactly. This is the EF. Yeah, the spark bark. Uh, and so this is the escape, the escape uh, module, of th that. That seemed to have worked better, uh, but again, lots, Still lots of fatalities. But then there's fatalities in every kind of ejection system. So. Yeah, of course. Yes. Um, and then we wanted to still look at the um, ah yeah yeah we want to continue the the the, the two story. deltas the two deltas the yes. Converse so story that's we'll the one hundred six 
we just looked at the XP, uh, the B58, and so this is the um, 106. Yeah. That's right. And the 102 is, should be right here. No, you can see both. Great. Um, I have some better pictures of the 102, so let me just go and, and bring those up because that are that is relevant. Um, F102, and maybe we'll see. Oh, so you see the the Coke bottle shape pretty nicely here. Yeah, the wasping. The that's wasping. a that's a 102A. That they yes, that's one of the so so what we see in the what we had seen in the um, um, uh, XF ninety two was this this shape where it kind of you know was this round bullet this, this bullet. cylinder with wings stuck on it yes a cylinder with with wings stuck on it and um, they they tried to they tried this um, first. They kind of made this um, uh, was an aerodynamic design, which I showed you, right? So this was the XF ninety two, and the original F one hundred two looked very similar to that. And then they flew this, and uh, found that they could not um, exceed the the speed of sound, and they were baffled by um, their aerodynamic tests. And then uh, there was a, um, uh, a guy in NACA, the precursor of uh, NASA, called Whitcomb. And he had figured out um, through research that um, the shape of the aircraft needs to be in a particular way. And that is that the um, cross section of the aircraft needs to be effectively uniform across the entire length of the aircraft. So what they started to do is to add, and you'll see this here, when it gets when the aircraft get when the aircraft gets skinnier, they added extra um, mass, effectively or extra space in yeah, the area. Aircraft. Extra area, yes. And then here, which you can better see in this picture, right, they removed area. So this is why you get this Coke bottle shape. And then they made this a, bit, a little bit wider again of, over here. So the effect of that is because the wings are attached here, all the, 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 the extra cross section needs to be compensated by making the middle um, skinnier. You can see this pretty well. So, so this became really the an issue here with the with the F one hundred two first. That's where that's the aircraft that kind of set in the middle of that this discovery of that area rule, um, which then become became a very pronounced um, thing in uh, in later fighters. Like you all can also see this in the uh, the F sixteen shows it really clearly. Yeah, the right. the best the best example of that, however is oh yeah sure the f5 the f5 is the ultimate the ultimate area ruled so now you make the cockpit bigger and then it as soon as the cockpit starts to end you have the inlets and so they provide the same amount of area and then as the wing appears you tighten the fuselage up more and more and more and then as the wing ends you expand it out again that's right. So you can see you can see exactly. Um, wait, I have a few good pictures of this. So you can see here where the wings attach. That's when the that's where the or here you can actually see this pretty well. So the wing the wing where the wing attaches that fuselage becomes super super narrow because ultimately what they would try to do is you have a, a you start with a certain cross section. Um, in the cockpit area, and you want to make sure that that exact that cross section remains the same across the stretch of the aircraft. So, if you attach your wings, you add volume um, on the side effectively of the aircraft, and that volume needs to go from the core fuselage. Um, and that seems so. You weird. should be able to cut a line anywhere along the length of that aircraft and add up the total area, and it's the same all the way along. 
Correct. And it yes. all comes down to shock waves, that the shape of you, every time you expand the total cross-section area, you will create a new shock wave, and that shock wave generates additional drag. And so at a perfectly designed aircraft, there are exactly two shock waves, off the nose and off the tail, which is why that in is... larger aircraft, you hear the sonic boom twice, bang, bang, like the shuttle. Yes. So that's uh, so that is effectively that is the core that is the core story of the 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 aerodynamics here of these aircraft. Those two aircraft, the F one hundred two, and then later the F one hundred six. This is the direct successor of it, and it's uh, if a direct evolution of it. Also a Delta aircraft, so it's it's the same heritage from the XF ninety two. Um, the XF ninety two was effectively the direct predecessor of the F one hundred two uh, of the F one hundred two here. Um, those were also in, in the inter interceptor roles, and the F-106 was for the longest time into the 1980s, um, the main interceptor of the uh, U.S. Air Force that was stationed mostly across the coastlines uh, of um, the uh, United States. And you can see um, here, um, I don't know which, which state that is. Um, but those ended up being flown mostly by the Air National Guard. Mm -hmm. um, and I think into the beginning of the 90s, um, the Air National Guards effectively on, in most of the states and the, at, the border line, at the borders of the United States that had F-106s, um, they were then flying when the F-106s were uh, replaced in that interceptor role. And a lot of these um, airplanes then got turned into target drones. Eventually. Yes, that, that was, the, that was the, the end of life of all those is that the Air Force then collected them all and turned them into the QF-106, which were then target drones. Yeah, and 102s um, as well, and 4s, yeah. which hurts me more. And yes. now there are now QF-16s. So the original Block 10 and 20 F-16s are target drones today. Yeah. But their airframes are worn out. Like, there's no repairing them. They're done. So you, you, you use them one last time. That's right, yeah. Um, and then um, I think we want to look at one last aircraft, and we're pretty, doing pretty well on time. There's an F-4. There's an F-4. But the last aircraft... Um, uh, 117? We want to look at is the 117. Yes. How unlikely of an How airplane are we talking here? Yes. How can this even fly? Hmm. But, you That's know, you case. still see some lines of tacit blue in here and those tail fin, the, 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 the elevons. Yeah. It's there. So, you know that you, know, you keep hearing they're flying these again. Uh, they're still flying. So they're all, so ex all for, except for a handful, um, this was the first one that went on display. Yeah. Um, apparently, apparently at great expense because... They had to scrape all the paint off because oh. the paint is still classified. Right. Um, and so then had to kind of restore and repaint it. So the paint that's on here is not at all genuine. The, yeah, the radar um, absorbent paint. Then the Reagan library now has one. That's the other one that's on display. That sits on the front of it. Right. Um, and so they are now readying a few more, but they're all sitting, still sitting at the Tomopa, I think, uh, test range. Where they wrapped. have been stationed, huh? And they're all wrapped in plastic, and and but they're all they're all still sitting there, and um, they are fly they're still keeping some of them flying. Um, the 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 and nobody knows why. Well, some of them. Yeah, they keep hearing the occasional sightings by the Area Fifty One folks of uh, of a one seventeen. It's got to be doing radar testing of some kind. Yeah. I'm, my guess is that they're using that that they're using them for the B twenty one program. Yeah, I mean, I I get that because clearly B twenty one is development. I don't know what the role would be. The only thing I could think of is they needed this. They need something stealthy to test their own tracking equipment. And that's possible. That's where they could fly it. Yeah, because the but you they're... know some of the new Russian aircraft are getting closer to real stealth. So, you know, yeah, I mean the Su fifty seven certainly does. Yeah. So, it, so you need you need a test platform. And as much as this plane's got serious issues, it's freaking stealthy. If you can track it, it you can track anything. Yeah. That's right.
problem with us investing in developing um, ways to defeat the stealth for like U.S. protection is, you know, we got direct conduit for all of that IP, all that engineering to go to the other countries. Um, you know, it's, we're very, uh, what's the uh, permeable? Um, Leaky? Like, we do not have good security controls over our, the IP developed here in the U.S. for defense. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think, I think that's right. But, um, and yet we keep seeing these things flying once in a while, onesies, twosies, which is interesting. Yeah, but 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 um, just to that to that point, I think there has been some there have been some uh, uh, some learning um, uh, around um, the IT protection because um, it is now so that if as a if you are introducing the F thirty five as a customer. So any of the NATO countries who have them now, um, they can't even program the aircraft. They, they are figuring out what the missions is and then they have people from Americans, um, from Lockheed, who are embedded with them, who they, will, who they say, this is what we want to do, and they program the aircraft for them. It's a completely close box. So they have no right to repair Digital Millennium Act, just like uh, nice. John Deere John and Caterpillar. Deere, yeah. And that's why, that's why the Germans <laughs> didn't take it. That, you that's, only, that's, you that's, only thought it was your tractor. Yeah, that's, yes. That is, what, that, that, is, that is why the Germans didn't take it, is um, that the Germans said, no, we're, we're not going to do this shit. Yeah, we're not giving uh, up the control of our, our military, essentially, is what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Because because literally you can't you can't program your own aircraft. Like the pilots can sit in it and they can fly the mission and you can give you can say what you want to do, but you the interface between how all that shit works, between the mission profile and how that gets into the airplane is secret. And it's only only the Americans control it. Yeah, that seems unacceptable. Yeah, that's not that's not um, that is really not acceptable. All right, so I think for, in terms of the Air Force Museum tour, we're done and we're through with the two hours of, of doing that. Um, so that Got was through fun. pretty now, quickly. Yeah, it did. <laughs> so Joe is keen on showing us the, the Naval uh, Aviation Museum and we need to go and find some time for that. Because yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to ask around, see what people think. Yeah. I, I answered a few questions in the chat, but if there's any other questions, by all means, jump in. Yeah, um, because Joe, um, I'm now after two hours of talking, a little spent. I have to say. Yeah, no, two hours, plenty of time. I think we've worn everybody out. Yeah. Uh, um, what did you fly, Joe? Uh, so I don't fly because on the physical, the I was accepted to U.S. Naval Academy, mm -hmm. and on the physical, they found that my left eye was 2025, so they said I couldn't be a pilot. So I told him to go to hell, and I didn't go to the Navy. I didn't uh, go to Annapolis. Go. So I can't fly. Uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not doing this. Yeah. But uh, my family, um, all of my family, both grandfathers, my father, his brother, everyone in our family are military pilots. Oh, yeah. And uh, so many generations. And um, uh, they're all naval aviation except for Grandpa Roberts, but we try not to hold it against him. He was Army Air Corps. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, which is now the Air Force. Yes. The, yeah. So, so you know, I come from many generations of family where, um, you know, there's the Air Force, but when you actually need work done, they go to the Navy. And even like when the weather is bad and the Air Force, um, uh, the Air Force officers need to get somewhere, they would take Navy plane because Air Force only flies in blue sky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey. I'm ready to wrap so, up. I'm going to stop the recording. Now yes. We, you know, we've got the insults of the Air Force on record. Yes, right. <laughs> so <laughs> I prepared things to show. Are we not? Uh... Uh, uh, two hours is kind of my limit, Joe. But we could, yes. we'll, we'll definitely right. make another time. We'll do this again. Well, let's do it again. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yes. We'll do it again, and then, you can, and then you can show us the Naval Aviation Museum. Yeah, Eldert's keen for next week. So let's book something for next week. Go ahead. Fantastic. All right. Yes. Thanks, so folks. Exactly.